So greetings, everyone. My name is Ann Laver, and I am assistant professor in Sentner School of Music and the university organist at Syracuse University. I'm here with my colleague, Natalie Draper, who is assistant professor of music in composition and theory at Syracuse. Hi, Natalie. Hi. <laughs> So we'd like to welcome you to the continuation of our web series, Composing for the Organ, a composer interview project. So this project, if you've been following along and watching some of our other videos, is part of a larger uh, endeavor that we've embarked on this summer entitled Composing for the Organ. Uh, we're introducing a webinar and a virtual concert on September 12th, 2020 which will be hosted by Syracuse University. And our primary goal in offering these programs was to give educational opportunities uh, to organists and composers as a way of, of engaging with contemporary organ music. Part of the reason for this is that we know the organ can be an intimidating instrument, um, especially if composers haven't had a background playing the instrument or uh, engaging with the instrument. So we hope that by offering these programs, uh, those composers may uh, find some inspiration, find some advice and tips about how to construct pieces, what works best on the instruments, and uh, hopefully be inspired to write some more new music. So today we will be speaking with composer and organist Martin Herschenroder from Germany. We welcome you, Martin. We're so happy you're here in our Zoom room today. Hi, Annie. N nice to be with you. <laughs> so before we start asking Martin some questions, I'd like to give a little bit of biographical information about him and his work. Martin Herschenroder the composer, organist, and musicologist, and is a professor at the University of Siegen in Germany. His compositions have been performed in Europe, Asia, and America by renowned artists. Besides concert tours as an organist, his teaching activities have brought him to almost all of the continents. Martin has been active as a guest professor of organ and improvisation, or organ and composition, excuse me, at the Eastman School of Music since 2008. His piece for solo organ, Toccata and Lament, was premiered by Hans Davidson at the dedication of the Craighead Saunders organ in Rochester that year. His compositions for organ appear on the CD titled Linien aus Nachtlicht, which was released by Neos in 2015. So Martin, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um... I'm very happy to be with you and thanks to Zoom as we can travel this year and I hope this will help for your project. Yeah. All right, so we wanna start off, um, the way we've been starting off with most of these uh, interviews is just asking you to tell us a little bit about what first led you to compose for the organ. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, um, I started learning to play the organ when I was 14. Um, and I had been composing for the piano and other instruments before, so it was quite natural for me to uh, write some stuff for the organ. And yeah, maybe it's a bit awkward, but <laughs> that time I was writing Baroque fugues and all that stuff. For, so it was E major and very, uh, very bright and very organ sound and all this. And I think really composing for the organ, as I would um, put it today, was much later when I had first um, listened to the music of Olivier Messiaen. And um, uh, there were recitals um, in the next bigger city. Um, where they had a very good organ there and, he, and the organist had a very good concert series where organists from all around the world came and played. And we had the opportunity to listen to um, Almut Rösler, who was one of the major figures in Germany at that time to promote Olivier Messiaen's music in the, in the beginning 70s. She was the one who brought Messiaen's music uh, mainly to Germany, I could say that. And she recorded and she played and she also uh, talked about this music. So it was my first contact to really contemporary music at that time. And uh, yeah, the moment I had listened to the first concert, it was strange for me, you know, uh, Nativity 
Do you say, yeah, and oh, this was crazy music, but in some kind I liked it. And uh, the, the morning afterwards, I tried to, uh, to improvise and write something which was alike. And maybe it was not alike, I don't know, <laughs> it's lost. Fortunately, it's lost, yes. <laughs> Conveniently, nobody can find. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, I'm, like, maybe, you know, when I, when my children have to organize all my stuff in my uh, drawers, so I don't know. <laughs> Do you find that, um, you know, I think it's composers always have a sort of an interesting relationship when they play an instrument that they're writing for. Has playing the organ affected the way you think about how to compose for the instrument? Um, yeah, that's a complex question because um, um, when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15, I was a beginner, so um, I did not really have um, the approach to the organ I have now. So uh, these things changed, of course. And of course, it also changes according to what you play. Uh, the, maybe the first years, um, the first two years, I, I had a very good teacher who was so bad to make me uh, do finger <laughs> etudes and all this stuff for two years. It was a disaster mentally, but it was great. So at that time, <laughs> my, my music didn't have to do anything with, with which I was uh, practicing. Afterwards, I was practicing Bach, and of course, you don't want to, to compose always like Bach. I told you about the Baroque Fugues, of course I did that. But after a while, when I just tried to get into contemporary music, um, my uh, approach to the organ changed. Uh, generally speaking, to come back to your question, of course, knowing some idiomatic approaches to the instrument um, is helpful, but it's also dangerous because <laughs> um, this is maybe, um, there are two instruments where this is really, or three instruments, where this is really dangerous. It's the guitar and the organ, and maybe the harp, because it's so complicated uh, that you have to practice very long, very long, and after a while, you are so good that you always uh, tend to do what you know, and of course you don't want to do that when you compose new music. So um, you have to uh, know that, and you have to be good in, um, analyzing that you don't get trapped uh, in this uh, kind of writing too much idiomatically. I think writing idiomatically is good, but with new ideas, if, if it works that way, this would be great. Like Volumina by Ligeti, for example. It, it's completely new, but it's idiomatic. You can do it and it's very organ-like. And of course, we want to have these pieces and I try to write that, that way. So. Um, the answer to your question, yes, the instrument is very important, even knowing what I can do. Um, but, you know, when you write for the marimba phone or, I don't know, accordion, you have to know what you do. If not, people won't play it and can't play it. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I remember um, my first big orchestra piece. I, I wrote a strange part for the harp and it was an old lady, she was good. But she said, no, no, yeah, I can't play that. That's not playable. And I, I had to show her. I knew it was good. So uh, she didn't say a word and she did it. But of course you have to do it with every instrument and of, also with your own instrument. Okay, I stop with that. <laughs> yeah, so there's a learning curve with the organ. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting that you say organ, guitar, and harp because actually <laughs> <laughs> when uh, this has come up a few times and almost every composer says, those are the those are the three. Those are the <laughs> yeah. Um So it's it's you know it just it's kind of interesting, and I think part of what we're after is trying to um, to give composers some of the tools so they can get to the point where they can write for this instrument, even if they haven't had the experience that you've had, uh, yeah. you know, working things out. Um, I I want to just follow up with that question because you raise an interesting point about. Um, possibly becoming complacent in, you know, since you know the, how the instrument works. Um, and I wonder if improvisation plays a role in your process at all, how it might relate to your compositional process, if at all, maybe it's something totally separate for you, but I know you do improvise as well, so. Yeah, and 
That's a very interesting question because, you know, I'm the generation that was, was raised in the aftermath of Syrian music. So my first teachers, composition teachers, <laughs> they, of course, they made us uh, write rows and uh, invent crazy structures and all this stuff. And of course I did and I find that interesting because this gives kind of an identity of, to your music. That's even up to a certain point, it's necessary to have that. But if you, um, if you get too strict with the, your structures and with yourself and, and it covers your ideas and um, from a certain point, maybe it drowns your ideas and you don't want that. So in these moments, improvisation is very helpful because you can't control um, too much of the structure. You, you, I don't know anybody in the world who can really improvise good 12 term music. I don't know, I can't do that and I don't want to do that. It's not the aim of improvisation. No. Um, and so it's, it's, um, um, you need both. You need uh, being structured to get a good composition, to get an, in, uh, yeah, what I would call a character of your piece. This is also a question of composition and organizing and a sound family creating things that belong together. Improvisation, on the other hand, gives you the opportunity to let your brain follow um, intuitively things you wouldn't have um, invented by uh, following your structures. So for me, both of it, it's, it's very important. And we, we talked about Toccata and Lament in your moderation, you, you talk, um, no, you, this was a thing. <laughs> Hans <laughs> called me, I don't know, was it? I think it was July or August. I think it was August. You know, the inauguration was on October 18th. <laughs> so, and uh, he said, okay, when you come, why don't you write a new piece for the inauguration? I said, hi. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think I have some other work? <laughs> but anyway, of course I wanted to do that. So I did. And, and the first thing for inventing this piece was that I went to the organ, tried to imagine the instrument. I had to try to Google a bit and then get a sound idea. And the first things I did was improv improvising. And then of course, after a while you have some sketches and then you, um, think what you are doing, you analyze your music, get um, the connections between different ideas and get an idea about how to develop things and so on. And after that, composing really starts. But improvisation is a source of inspiration, a source of invention, um, like a quarry for your materials sometimes. And sometimes it, it's helpful. You don't need it uh, um, necessarily, but sometimes it can help you very much. That's great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, getting back to this idea of the organ being one of these three instruments that's very <laughs> difficult to write for, um, could you talk some about what is challenging about writing for the organ and also on the flip side of that, what is gratifying about writing for it? Um, my perspective is different from uh, the perspective of my students, for example. So um, speaking of normal composers who are not used to um, playing the organ every morning, um, the challenge is that the organ is so interesting and so complex that you would not think what it can do. So learning about what the organ can do is learning um, that there are many, many other paths for inspiration and in, uh, invention to be found, even for me, who really knows the instrument. So there are so many things. And also because the organs are so different, there is not any organ on this planet that is completely um, comparable to any other one. So every instrument is different. So um, you're... Um, Mm. Yeah, mm. your experience with this instrument, with this specific instrument, will always be a bit different. And there are organs like the Craighead Saunders organ in Rochester, it's a personality. Like you are sitting there and they say, okay, what do you want to tell me? And there are other organs you have to force, uh, like, I don't know, like a horse that doesn't want to go. <laughs> so I said, just try. And so, so it, every instrument is a bit different and you learn a lot. So. 
And this is the challenge, learning and getting an idea of what the organ can tell you, what the organ wants you to do, what it um, offers you that you can do. On the other hand, gratifying is um, the moment, and um, uh, for me, the most important thing is the sound. I think, I think this was maybe even the reason why I um, decided to leave the piano and go to the organ after a while, because the sound, it's so, it's, it's great. You have the organ and all these different stops and the pipes, and you have the space, which is so important. I really love the space. There are many of my colleagues have an organ at home, I don't, because I love being in the church and having this acoustics. And I think this is part of the, the whole thing, of this gratifying uh, instrument that gives you being uh, surrounded by the sound, being inside the sound, being part of the sound, um, being resonant. Persona, this is interesting, it's the Latin word. It's, it's somebody where it sounds through, personare. And I think this is what you experience on the organ. Okay, just <laughs> the deviation. No, that's great. I mean, I, I've been working on a piece that I just finished for Annie and it's, um, yeah, it's the, I got to sit at an organ when I was finally sort of learning how to do this. And the first time that I started really making sounds that made sense to me there, the, the sound is just amazing. It's, yeah, it's, amazing. Oh, it's a really special thing to be able to sit there and, and have it be this enormous presence, even if it's soft, you know, like it's, whether it's soft or loud, it's all, it's all around you, which is really cool. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any sort of specific or particular compositional techniques or procedures that you have found to be particularly good with the organ? No. <laughs> <laughs> composing is composing. So um, you know that you're a composer. <laughs> you're sitting there and you start a new work and you don't know what happens. Um, the good pieces compose themselves. So <laughs> that's, so you follow the path of the music and Sometimes if you don't listen or if you, I don't know, if you start with the wrong thing, I don't know, it's bad. And, and the same thing with organ music. <laughs> Sometimes, um, Toccata and Lemon, once again, um, the first idea I had was exactly what I needed. And the piece, it was so fast, I could write it. And the next organ piece, it was a disaster. <laughs> it, it took me months to get where I wanted. And, and maybe it's, it's even uh, raté. <laughs> you, you needed that uh, Hans Davidson deadline looming in front of you. Yeah, may, maybe the deadline. Yeah, of course, every, every composer needs a deadline. <laughs> Nobody would write any piece without a deadline. But um, yeah, um, the deadline is, can also be an obstacle because you know I have to be there next Sunday and um, ah, <laughs> you beat your head and inspiration just says tomorrow. <laughs> you can't force it. So um, there's, there's no, I think um, every composer has to find his ways into composing. And if he or she has found his or her ways, they will work on the organ too. And usually you have um, um, several procedures to get where you want and um, you need several. Sometimes one does not work and it's the same with the organ. Um, if you have, if you started in the wrong, the wrong way, just put it away, try it with new sketches and so on and so on. Same procedure. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer. Um, since that you did start at the organ, um, has your writing changed for the organ? I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but could you talk some more about how your writing has changed over time? Um, even maybe in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years of sort of how you approach writing for the instrument. Yeah, of course it has. And I'm not going to talk about these youth, uh, youthly sins. Um, <laughs> just start with the, um, the music. For me, my organ music starts with Linien aus Nachtlicht. It's the title of the CD. Uh, this is from 1991. I wrote this piece for my uh, final exam at the Cologne Musikhochschule. Um, so one of the programs I had to play, I, I um, yeah, suggested that I would play um, first performances of new pieces. It's kind of risky for an exam, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I had half of it was Bach and the other half was uh, contemporary music. And so to be 
safe, at least with one piece uh, besides the Bach, I wrote an own piece. And this is my first real composition, was also the first one to be printed. And this was, um, yeah, kind of a, a summing up of what I had learned at the um, conservatory at the School of Music. Um, so in, 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 this, in this springboard, can you say that? Is that an American word? Yeah, springboard was, <laughs> sorry for asking, um, was kind of messier, but it's different. So it's, it's a bit, let's say it says a French accent. Yeah, that's, that's a good expression, a French accent, but it's, it's Herrchenröder. So the first piece, um, Paul Kleeblatt, Drei Linien aus Nachtlicht, from 1991. Then, some year, um, there were some minor pieces. Some years later, I got the um, opportunity um, to have a commission uh, to write new pieces for the re-inauguration of a historic instrument in Naumburg. Naumburg is, um, oh, you know that, there, there's, um, uh, Naumburg is one of the very, very famous um, organs related to Johann Sebastian Bach was uh, created by organ builder, German organ builder Zacharias Hildebrand in 1746 and Bach inaugurated the instrument and he examined the instrument very, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> definitely. So um, the instrument was restored and um, for the re-inauguration um, they gave a commission, uh, namely two commissions uh, actually, um, for, because they restored the repository first in, in 1996 and then five years later the whole organ and they gave a commission um, for, yeah, <laughs> this was an interesting idea because um, not everybody in Naumburg was amused that the organ would be restored to the original shape of the Bach time because they said, okay, the, nobody will be able to play contemporary music. Um, I'm not really sure if they meant contemporary, maybe them, <laughs> their idea was to play romantic music, I don't know. But anyway, there, there was some criticism about that. So they decided to give a commission to show that contemporary music could be played and composed for the organ. Um, and okay, I had the um, honor to write these pieces. And of course, these pieces were different from the first piece in 1991, because I had to, and my idea was to display some of the major features of these organs, major features of these organ, this organ, um, uh, to show what it was able to do and also to relate a bit to Johann Sebastian Bach, not so much to Messiaen, who had no relation to this instrument. So, um, and of course, um, at that point, I was really aware of everything which had been done in the contemporary um, organ music since 1961. So um, I had a new um, conscience about what um, I wanted to do. So it should be really on uh, top of the uh, development of contemporary organ music. And what came out was really very different from the first organ piece. This is my uh, cycle, uh, it's a, it's a cycle uh, called Zeitraum. Zeitraum 1, one, and the second one for the whole organ from uh, 2001. So these pieces are much more aware of, of avant-garde techniques and sound uh, composition and all this stuff. And yeah, and Toccata and Lament, maybe in this, this is in still some years later, this was 2008. And now the te technical side of the, the organ, I knew everything, I think, what could be done. And the new question for me was at that point, um, to regain the quality of express, expressiveness. Is that a good word? Yeah, expressiveness, expressivity? Because, um, of course, sound has an expressive quality and you can compose sound and have the expressive quality aside, but you can also think of what do you want, which atmosphere, which character, and then uh, look for the right sound. And that's Toccata and Lemon. So it's a bit different. And um, the Lemon, which is a Baroque, form, of course, Baroque form, um, is really a lament, but in terms of a contemporary um, uh, music language. So um, the first idea about, behind this piece is that I really wanted to have a piece that makes the church and the organ burst with expressive quality. And at that point I had um, enough technical uh, ideas how we could do that on the organ. So the approach is a bit different, but the means are the same. 
And at the same time, this piece brings together the, the, these, these first pieces like Linien aus Nachtlicht with this kind of French influence and uh, these avant-garde-like um, pieces from the late 90s combines everything. So it's kind of a uh, summing up of this. Um, at this very moment, I'm planning for a new organ piece, actually for Naumburg, because next year will be the 275th birthday of the organ. <laughs> so we are planning for a concert with a, with a new uh, um, piece. And at this moment, I'm very interested in the specific qualities of temperament, which is very, very interesting on the organ. I, my, one of my last organ pieces is, um, this is Ophelia's Tears. Um, that I wrote for a mean tone instrument. And you have so interesting um, differences between dissonances and all these qualities of dissonance we know from our um, modern temperament. And you have these, these very, very bad biting dissonances coming from mean tone temperament, which is like that off with. <laughs> so, and, Trying that with a, a, a well-tempered organ, a noun book is a well-tempered organ, of course, it's an organ of, from Bach time. Um, and you have these very interesting qualities of triads, for example. Um, when I was a student, of course, nobody was allowed to compose triad. That was impossible. <laughs> Germany in the 80s, no, no, that didn't work. Today we are a bit, yeah, um, so um, it's a kind of a relaxation. And, um, yeah, so I try, I work with triads now because on these temperaments, that's interesting. You get specific qualities. You can make them dirty by adding different sounds and you can make them pure. And so this is a very interesting uh, um, field of research. I should stop now because you may, may, might have other questions because I could talk about that for hours and hours. Sure. Well, I, I, one thing I just want to comment on is that um, you have had a lot of success writing for historic instruments. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know that that experience has opened up um, a lot of possibilities for you. So I think one thing we want to uh, just throw out there for composers that are you know maybe interested in writing for the organ, there is this kind of subset of instruments, historic instruments or mean tone instruments that. Mm -hmm. Um, really provide a lot of alternative possibilities um, that you could explore. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I hope it'll spark somebody's interest. Yeah, and of course you need, uh, being not an organist, you, you need to um, go on the, the organ bench and have some experience. Um, split keys, for example, nobody knows that on the piano, but of course for organists that's kind, kind of usual. So having this possibilities to have the A flat and the G sharp and oh, and the difference between them and you can play with that. That's great. Um, in Ophelia's Tears, I, I tried to, to bring that. So you have um, a B minor triad, which has a C sharp because there is no B, uh, D flat. So, ah, oh, that's interesting, oh, like that. And yeah, okay, so you can make your experiences, but of course you need to try. You, you can't imagine a mean tone a dissonance if you haven't heard it. and it makes uh, you being an organist, you know, even playing Bach, it's like a revelation. Uh, having these different well-tempered tuning systems, um, you get a different idea about um, points of interest in a composition because um, the B flat is a bit different, for example. So yeah, okay. So um, this, this is a very interesting point. That is, in any case, something I would recommend if you are aiming at young composers, don't be shy. Go on the organ bench, try to uh, grab a good organist and make him play for you and then go and try yourself because your ideas are in your mind and they have to find your way. And um, that's what I do with my students at Eastman. Um, um, the composition students who have not any experience on the, with the, uh, on the organ, they have to experience the organ themselves. And those who have organists and composers that they have to have the experience of contemporary organ music that is so different so that they also have a new experience of the organ where we need both. Okay, good. You, you provided a very nice segue into something we really wanted to talk to you about. Uh, and that is this long-term um, collaborative project that you've overseen at Eastman. And you've also been at Cornell University 
working with composers and organists and matching them up and helping them along in their creative process. So you've been doing this for over a decade, is that right? <laughs> since, since 2008 and with some interruptions, Corona uh, yeah, prevents us this year and 2015, but all the other years, yes. And actually we also did um, a comparable um, uh, project in Copenhagen at the um, uh, School of Music, um, Königliche Musikakademie, and it was Hans Davidson, who was in Copenhagen at that time. And it was completely different. Of course, the, the, the general approach is the same, but it was different because of the different organs and the different composers coming from different continents. It was very interesting, organ with instruments. Yeah. Um, I think um, this, is, is, this is a very interesting project for me and I love being there and working with uh, always these new generations of um, young composers and young organists. We have um, very good, very interesting departments of composition and organ at Eastman and, and young organists and composers who are interesting, interested can join us in seminars where we get some information on the organ in general and on some specific organs we want to write for and on organ music that has been written during the last decades so that we don't copy something we think to invent but we don't and, and on the other hand this is the composer side and the, on the other hand the organists who maybe have the first major experience with really contemporary music and it's of course exciting to um, accompany somebody writing a new piece, advise him on the organ, uh, or um, maybe being, yeah, the persona, <laughs> the, the person that uh, makes this music possible and, and uh, yeah, performs the, the new music that comes up in these projects. So tell us, can you tell us just a little bit about the time frame and structure for this? So you gather students in the fall and then the goal yeah. is for them to write a piece by, how, how long are you expecting them to work on a piece? Yeah, <laughs> My, I'm just looking at Natalie because she knows what I'm gonna say. Um, this, yeah, okay, our project at Eastman, um, I'm there in, in, for, uh, always in the beginning, we, in the first weeks of the fall semester. So generally we um, meet for seminars for two or three weeks every week or once or twice on the organ and in, in, in yeah, in seminar rooms and um, analyze and think and play and uh, yeah, try to um, come together. Uh, during this period, this I, I would call it the seminar period, we try to match, to bring together one organist and one composition student so that we will have pairs uh, who can work together afterwards. I will have left after a while. So, um, and of course I can, uh, I will advise the composers um, by uh, email and Skype and so on. This works quite easily, but um, I cannot um, be there and show something on the organ usually. And it's very helpful for the composition students to have an organist um, who we can meet with and then they go, um, yeah, go to Christchurch and say, okay, how, what, how was it Kasparini organ? Was it um, the pitch and the temperament? And was it, what is a Zimbelstern and all this stuff? Yeah. So they, they really can experience. And of course, after a while, he will have sketches or she will have sketch, sketches. And then they can try, does it work? Is it what I wanted? Are my ideas right? And so on and so on. So we have pairs of uh, usually two. Mm. Now, when I have left, they begin working and for me, the timeline is always, we want to finish the composition first. This is, it should be done after half a year. Um, smile, <laughs> because <laughs> this is exactly after Christmas um, and everybody knows what's happening there. So nobody has time to finish it. Um, okay, usually in March, I get the first sketches. No, it's not like that, but sometimes it's really bad. Okay, we try to be um, done by February, March with the composition with all of my advice and all this working on the organ bench and so on. And after that, the organist has to practice the, the piece. Um, why? And then, of course, the, 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 the first performances will be in September when I'll be, I'll be back. 
of course, it's a long time from maybe April to September for the organist to practice. And usually they don't need that time. Um, it's good to have a month as a buffer in between. And on the other hand, this, um, this time in between is also good for something else because some of the composers want to do new things. And it can be very challenging, even for a really skilled organist as we have in Eastman, you know, the Eastman organ uh, student, they are great, but sometimes the uh, comp composer, I don't know, maybe he's a guitarist and he has crazy ideas what to do on the organ and it's not idiomatic, so you have to invent your techniques to make it happen. And so you need some ample time, really ample time to do that. And at Eastman we have the three month rule, <laughs> so <laughs> being three months before the concert being ready, this means we have to uh, have the composers uh, do their work until February. So this is the time scale. Sometimes it's much denser and we can, we, we don't know, depending on the conditions we have. But usually it's the seminar, maybe a month, then we have the comp composition, the sketch period, then we have the composition period, maybe uh, all about half a year and then the practicing, the working together, the fine tuning, and after that, the first performance, and then hopefully other performances. Yeah, so you bring, um, you bring everybody together again in the following September for a concert. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a really we cool. We need to have the performances. Yeah. And this is uh, important for everybody, um, especially for the composers, because they, they have to, to hear what they did. And, and to match, if it, is it my idea? What happened? What changed? What had to be changed? What would I like to change? And so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a it's a great model and and one that uh, um, actually Natalie and I were kind of involved with over this summer. So that was really yeah. cool to experience it firsthand. But one that we want to uh, develop at Syracuse as well. So. This is a good, uh, I think it's a really good model that you've set here. Uh, could be applied to other instruments as well. It doesn't just need to be sure. one. Yeah, I, um, I made an attempt um, with, yeah, it didn't work out up to now, but I really would appreciate that. I think it's, it's a very good idea because mm, we have so skillful uh, uh, performers at our, our schools, why don't we try to use the expertise and this is so, for me, it's um, obvious to, to try that. And yeah, I really appreciate that we can do that in Eastman, at Eastman for years. And um, we have had a good output of some very interesting pieces. And of course, the most interesting pieces are not um, uh, actually um, um, apparently uh, written by organ, um, uh, playing composers. Sometimes, yes, but not, um, it's not, uh, does not have to be that way. Sometimes it's really, I don't know, composers coming from the travel recorder who had very good ideas in Copenhagen. It was such a, it was crazy, but was really good. So, yeah, okay. Um, maybe I, let me um, point out to something which I find very important. Um, it is useful and even necessary to have a reference instrument for these projects so that everybody can go and go to the organ and try what um, he wants to have, uh, what he wants to have uh, heard, listened, being, uh, being listened to. But as we know, every organ is different. And it's also necessary to, uh, to take into consideration that um, my piece, if I want it to be played, not only at one organ, um, is able to be transferred to other instruments. So the second step I try to in, uh, include into, in, into these projects is that we try to go uh, to another instrument and try if it works there. Not to make uh, composers shy, because of course it's, it's good to write for a specific quality of a specific instrument, because this makes your uh, ideas jump. But on the other hand, if you write a piece that only works on one organ, it's, yeah, it's kind of tricky. Um, 
so we, we want to have this perspective, at least this perspective. What can we do with this piece that is really able to put forward these specific qualities of this crack at Sonus organ? What do we, what do we maybe um, lose or what do we have to change when coming uh, to other instruments? But I think this is, an, uh, this is necessary to reflect uh, that and this, uh, yeah, to, um, to reflect um, what kind of um, yeah, qualities my piece needs to um, be uh, being adapted to other contexts. That's really great. It sounds like a fantastic program and it's fantastic that you're also giving that advice about transferring the piece to different instruments. I think that's, you know, that's something that I actually didn't really fully realize until I had been uh, practicing some of it on this one organ and then the final piece is being performed on another and I was like, wow, this yeah. one's totally different. It's totally different. different it's yeah. amazing. Um, but on, so in that sort of way of thinking, you know, that's sort of an, a good last piece of advice, I think. Are there any other remaining pieces of advice you'd like to offer composers who would be listening to this interview about anything involving writing for the organ? I think maybe some of those who are listening now um, will consider writing their first pieces for organ. And I think what I recommend first is, um, the second step for me is the technique, but the first step is the imagination of sound. Just let you being inspired by the sound of the organ, by the idea, what do you want to happen in the space? What kind of sound do you want to have? Think, or, think big, something you want to hear, and then try to find it. Not the other way around, uh, try to understand what is a undamaris, and you will learn that. Of course, you will have to learn that because you have your sound in here. But I think this way is the important one. So the sound first, and then try to find uh, the tools you need to bring forth that sound. That's great. Thank you, Martin. It's, it's wonderful to talk with you. Um, we want to wrap this interview up just by thanking uh, anyone who's watching for joining us today. Uh, we're going to share a screenshot of your CD, Martin. Um, this is Linien aus Nachlicht. Oh yeah, okay, this is, yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's on Spotify, by the way, for those um, who don't have a CD player now, like my new car, <laughs> you're so crazy, you can't play CDs, but uh, it's on Spotify and also on Naxo, so it should be available. Yeah, great. Yeah. But, you know, if you want the physical CD, this is the place to find it, but... Uh, I love the CD because it, it has a wonderful booklet and it's uh, even with English uh, tra and translations, so everybody can read it. It's wonderful. very good. Good work. I, I, Neos, is, they made a wonderful job uh, playing this city. I have to say that. That's great. So you'll, um, you know, on, on any of these streaming services, you'll be able to find the pieces we've been talking about, Takada and Lament. That was the one we mentioned a few times that uh, Martin wrote for the dedication of the Craighead Saunders organ in, in um, 2008, but also Zeitraum, Eins und zwei, yes. uh, and, and all the other uh, pieces from 1991 on that uh, Martin has, has written through 2015. Um, we also want to invite you to join us on September 12th for our Composing for the Organ webinar. So we'll be continuing to discuss these topics. We'll have a score reading session. We'll hear from some other composers and performers. And then at 7.30 that night, will be releasing a virtual concert of new music for the organ. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks again for joining us today. It's wonderful to yeah. speak with you. Yeah, all. thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, I wish you much success and many followers on any social media that are involved. Yeah, thank you for the interview. And yeah, hopefully see you again next year. Yeah. 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 OK, take care. Goodbye. Bye. Nice to meet you, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you.